if math is the key, what should it unlock? And I wrote a talk, and it was about three hours long. So <laughs> you'll be pleased to hear that I've condensed, I've taken it down, I've tried to pick out some of the key points. And it's kind of a bit of a whistle-stop tour of um, people's answer around the world to this question. Um, and the kind of direction of travel and thinking about maths and, and maths education, um, as I see it. One of the... Um, one of the ways of thinking about this question, what should it unlock, is really about, uh, it's similar to asking the question, what's maths education for? Um, if you were at the IEA conference uh, earlier this year, Andreas Schleicher was a speaker there. Andreas is the uh, director of education at the OECD. Um, so the OECD are responsible for the PISA work, and that's the PISA assessment, that comparison of 15 year olds around the world. Um, and also the, um, the OECD 2030 pro Education 2030 project, looking at you know, really driving some really strong policy work similar to our capabilities work. If you're engaged with that work, you might go back and have a look at the OECD website and just put all, all the new resources, all the new thinking, videos of kids, uh, some of the descriptions of some of the work that they're doing. That just went on the website this last week, the Education 2030 website. Um, I picked out a cheeky piece from um, Andreas talking about maths. Um, let me just play it. I'll return to that. Trigonometry always seems to be the really good example that we get into with that. Um, Andreas went on, of course, to talk about some of the aspects of uh, mathematics and particularly around the, the capabilities in the 2030 project. And I'll come back to Andreas and trigonometry um, in a little while. But that challenge there about, wow, well, why are we teaching this thing, trigonometry, really comes back to this question about what should maths unlock? Um, and he was talking there about the historical aspect of, of trigonometry. Um, and as I talk today about what maths should unlock, I think you'll see it. You'll definitely see some of the things you've seen in the workshops today, and I think you'll see your own practice um, in this as well, this, this direction of travel around the world. So for me, the first thing that maths uh, uh, thinking should unlock, uh, maths should unlock, is hard thinking. Rob Cole at um, uh, Durham University did a survey of all the definitions of learning. And the only one that he could find that stood up to any kind of scrutiny was uh, hard, hard thinking. When kids are doing hard thinking, then they probably learn. And we see that in all kinds of ways. We know that preschool literacy predicts school literacy. We know that preschool numeracy <laughs> predicts school numeracy. Not much, uh, not much uh, surprise in that. But we also know that preschool numeracy predicts school literacy. And it doesn't work the other way around. 
There's something about the thinking that goes on in numeracy that's special. Let's not say that literacy is not special as well, but there's something about the thinking. It's not the content, it's the thinking that goes on in numeracy that's special. Um, my former colleague, Peter Atkins at Oxford University, who is the best chemistry and the best maths teacher I ever came across, um, talked about how um, maths is the apotheosis of rational thought. And it's only by using maths that scientific speculation is sufficiently rigid to confront experience. You can have maths without science, but you can't have science without maths. There's something, there's something in it, as well as the tools that maths provide, this apio, apio, I can't say it now, apotheosis of rational thought and this, the rigidity that it brings uh, takes that scientific, those scientific hypothesis and stops them being jelly. So, hard thinking, of course, is the first thing that it should unlock. What about the second thing? I'm actually going to return to, to science. I just want to tell you some preliminary results from uh, Anne Pillman. Anne Pillman's a PhD student with me, um, and uh, Anne's an experienced primary school teacher. Uh, she did some work on earthquakes with, uh, she didn't do the work, the classroom teacher that she was working with did the work, year six, uh, six and seven students. Um, and we gave them this stimulus um, from a newspaper report of an earthquake and uh, the photograph there you can see the house has collapsed, the electricity lines have come down on a line on the floor, the power was cut off and so on. Um, and in this she asked the students, or teachers asked the students, what causes earthquakes like this? Well they'd just done a unit on earthquakes. So what the students did was, so the way in which Anne's coded the responses isn't kind of whether they're right or not. What she does is she says, is the response just not relevant? And that's the palest colour, the yellow there. Is the response kind of general knowledge? And Anne's rule of thumb for that is would. Uh, Anne's in a, I'm not sure she won't mind me saying, Anne's actually in a 60s, she's, a, she's an experienced teacher. And we'll talk about how a uh, rule of thumb for general knowledge is would her mum know the, know the answer to that? <laughs> so if her mum would, you know, a kind of educated woman, if her mum would, a general knowledge question, then, she, then it's in the general knowledge section. And then she's, what she's really looking for, of course, is a scientific response to the, to the question. They've just done earthquakes. Overwhelmingly, the students could give her a scientific answer. She had ready a prompt question. When I say a prompt question, I mean the answer. Uh, she gave the kids the answer, and you can see that um, uh, a few of the kids who were in the general knowledge moved over to the scientific. Uh, the kids had done electricity a couple of units before. So now she's asking the question, why might an earthquake cause power blackouts? They've just done this, not yesterday, but a little while ago. And half of the kids have got general knowledge. Almost the other half of the kids have got nothing. So she gave them the answer. Still not much. There's a massive transfer problem going on here. When we ask, when we, we do this thing where we teach the kids, we ask them questions, we ask them pr predictable questions, really what we can see is overwhelmingly they can tell us the answer. Now I'll say, take this information and apply it over here, and they've got nothing. You can see almost all the kids have got nothing. There's a massive transfer problem around the world um, in education. Uh, they hadn't learned about blackouts in the context of an earthquake, so they couldn't tell us anything about blackouts in an earthquake few kids who did give some answers, some kids said things like, the light goes out for the second one. The light goes out. That was interesting. It was just an interesting turn of phrase. The light goes out. And so we were thinking that what they're doing is they're going back to the lesson where they had wires and a battery and a switch and a cell and, 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 a, and a lamp holder. And what happens when you break the circuit? The light goes out. So there's no transfer. And if there's no transfer, then really, it's all a bit pointless. So, first, so the second thing, what maths uh, should unlock is transfer. Through mathematics, we should be developing transferers. Students who can take this idea and apply it over there. Students who can take this idea in science, or this idea here or there, and understand the maths behind it, and that the maths helps them to do the transfer, as well as transferring their mathematics. Um, I, I was, editing my talk as we went this morning when Caroline was talking about convergence. It struck me that what she was talking about was transfer. 
was actually bringing disciplines together in unusual ways. Uh, you can't see the disciplines in the context anymore. Disciplinary knowledge is still important, you just can't see it in its enactment. What we're asking people to do though is to take their expertise, their disciplinary knowledge in any discipline, and transfer it with others into this convergence. Some more research from around the world. This is some from Harvard University, a book that just came out a month ago, uh, six weeks ago, and uh, Jal Messer's group at Harvard. What they did was they went around America um, looking for, in fact, they were told that, here's a school who was leading, they're doing this or that, or they're doing this amazing stuff. They actually went into the classrooms and, and one of the things that they said in the book was, what a roller coaster ride. There were some amazing things going on in these American classrooms all across the country. But they saw a lot of, in this 10th grade English class, you know, the language is using, the students slumped their way through a fellow, only reading aloud when they were threatened with detention, <laughs> filling out a worksheet. They went into a biology class, passive listening teachers reading out, and the outcome was already known, you know, all these things. Um, and of course, in South Australia, I think we see ourselves as being beyond that. And the sorts of things that they saw in the classrooms, um, that are more like the classrooms you certainly heard about in, your, in the, in the uh, uh, workshops today, we talked about these integrated values. Now, that's, in, that's in, interesting in the first place, to talk about them as being integrated, all three of them together. Mastery, identity, and creativity. So mastery. You find this just in a snapshot. The students who had opportunities to develop knowledge and skill. Don't like the word opportunity. Every time I see the word opportunity, I hear inequity. If we're just, if we're just providing opportunity for, it, for students, what we know is that the students who are already doing pretty well will get better, and the students who are not won't. And so opportunity is inequity. Do kids have a learning entitlement. All of them have a learning entitlement, and that's, a, that's an equity entitlement. But still, as some of you went to the mastery uh, workshop earlier, it's, uh, students have those opportunities to develop skill and knowledge. I don't know if you talked about this in the workshop, but uh, the previous Commonwealth Chief Scientist, Ian Chubb, uh, commissioned a report about maths teaching. He said, well, let's just have a look at maths teaching all over the country and see what's common, see which textbook people are using, see which... What, what way and what teaching, what it is. Let's just find out what good math teaching looks like. <laughs> and of course, it's not that simple. But the report of that has just come out this week as well, uh, about improving the math performance of Australian students. And I just want to pick out a couple of, one thing really from the summary. The, the first thing is, is, as we all know, it's complex. And, and there's no such thing as best practice. Because it's way too, what we do is way too complex for there to be any such thing as best practice. But what I did find was that, what they did find in the study, that 87% of the schools who were getting that growth in student achievement were really focusing on mastery. That developing conceptual understanding, not just procedural fluency. And in fact, it was interesting the way that they described it in the paper, because they really, uh, they really showed the difference between demonstrating competence being performance and developing competence being mastery. Um, focusing on learning and understanding, not focusing on ability and performance. I'm sure you can all see mindset work in that. And then this last one about um, students, oriented students to strive and acquire to improve skills and understanding, and not masking the, any inferior ability that they've got, not looking at themselves relative to others. I cannot say enough that the face is not a competition. But of course, in students' minds, especially students who are looking for an ATAR, the face is a competition because of the ATAR, because we met comparing one student against another. Instead of saying, this is the bar, good enough, good enough. Um, we're doing some work with SATAC uh, on that uh, this year, and I'm hoping that things will change in the next, if not for this year's students, for next year's students, so we can shift this conversation away from a competition to being good enough. So we've got these integrated values, mastery being the first, what we're looking to do is unlock identity. Um, we've spent so much money, so much money in Australia on things like getting girls to engage with higher level maths and physical sciences. Caroline talk, touched on this a little bit this morning. And yet the, what the research shows us, for me, really clearly is 
that the thing that makes, one of the things, because it's complex, one of the factors that makes a massive difference is a sense of belonging. That often girls don't feel like they belong in physical sciences or maths. Students often from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, students who wouldn't traditionally do well, I'm not saying those students wouldn't traditionally do well, or students who wouldn't traditionally do well at, at science and maths, uh, they don't feel a sense of belonging. If you start with the content, the only way of belonging is to know all this stuff, to be good at the content. If you start with the science as a human endeavour, if you start with the maths investigations, if you start with what the, we were talking about in this room earlier, there's lots of ways of students finding belonging in their maths and in their, in their science. Maths should unlock identity, should unlock belonging. And then no surprise, the third one, uh, creativity. Maths should unlock creativity. So while these things are generic, and in fact, they were looking at these, the Harvard work was looking at this across all disciplines. If you look at those and think about the basis of the Australian curriculum in mathematics, so if you remember the basis, the research base that was used to build the Australian curriculum was this report from the state, big meta-analysis from the state called Adding It Up. And those five strands that they talked about have been interwoven strands. Integrated values, interwoven strands. And in the Adding It Up, what we had was um, procedural fluency that in the Australian curriculum became the fluency maths proficiency um, adaptive reasoning that became reasoning conceptual understanding that became understanding and strategic competence that became problem solving and they didn't call it problem solving in the, in the research, in the report because they wanted to make a distinction between kids solving maths problems and kids being problem solvers um, so it's strategic competence I've got no idea how to do that. Now what am I going to do? That being able to construct a response to the problem, rather than look at the problem and go, oh, I know how to do this, train how to do the problem and made that distinction. And then the fifth one in this, in the adding it up, was productive disposition that never made it into the Australian curriculum because it's a bit too hard. Um, but in the integrated values that Meta talks about now in this latest book, I see that productive disposition as being a bit the combination of the mastery, the identity and the creativity. And so, what's interesting is, of course, adding it up speaks to this as these things need to be unlocked for maths achievements. The strategic competence, the adaptive reasoning, the productive reasoning. <coughs> these things need to be unlocked for maths. But actually, I think if we think about it in the context of the conference today, these things can be unlocked by maths. These, can be the, these characteristics of learners can come out in mathematics learning. So, if maths is the key, what should it unlock? We've got hard thinking, we've got transfer, we've got mastery, identity and creativity, and the Australian curriculum or the adding it up proficiency. I think these things now, these are the things that we're talking about that are now non-negotiable. This is part of the learning entitlement of young people. And we're seeing that today all around the world that would be in Harvard and looking across the state. I'll show you some other work, some PISA work and some other work that's coming along. Uh, they're non-negotiable, but they may be what are called jagged in profile. So maybe some kids who've really got this capability in maths and this, this other, other kids have got this capability in maths. Um, at the moment, one of the things that we do, of course, in our uh, construction of assessment and evidencing is we, we, give, we have one dimension. We collapse everything into one dimension. You know, the final grade, and then we collapse all those subjects together and get the ATAR. Uh, we have this, this single dimension. And I think what we're seeing around the world through the Education 2030 project, through some of the work that you're doing in your schools around the capabilities, and we should have it in our maths proficiencies as well. What happened in the maths proficiencies is interesting. It was, I mean, Peter Sullivan, I remember him saying, Peter, who put the Australian curriculum and mathematics together, I remember Peter saying, if you're not developing the proficiencies, you're not teaching maths. And yet, when we looked at the achievement standards, it was really hard to see the proficiencies in there. It was very, uh, very much kind of a little bit of reasoning, a little bit of strategic competence, but really dominated by the procedural fluency uh, through schooling, um, at least. So I think about this now in multi-dimensional ways, this jagged profile where kids might be able to show us um, some of these characteristics in different ways. And of course, the opposite of that is, you know, if maths is a key, then what might get locked in? 
Um, and of course, I'm talking about, talk about hard thinking and the danger is that kids think about hard questions. Um, some of that work that was done in Port Augusta in Quorn, where the kids started to say, I'm looking at people who are responsible for that, where the kids started to say, um, I used maths used to be hard and I didn't like it, and now maths is hard and I like and I love it, because the definition of hard had changed. It was not knowing stuff before, and now it was hard thinking, and it changed the kids' disposition towards mathematics. I was talking about transfer, and of course the danger is that kids get locked into simple, familiar, and routine mathematics. Um, even you know, employers will say to us, these kids are not numerate. These kids leaving school, these, these particular aspects of the co-op, mm -hmm. they're not numerate. And we'll say to them, well, yes, they are. Look, they pass these tests. And they'll say, well, no, they are. And we'll say, well, yes, they are. And we kind of go around in circles. And what they're really saying is that they can't transfer it. They can't use the knowledge that they've got in this other context. They can't, uh, they can't do the, they can might do a near transfer, but they can't do the medium or far transfer. Talk about identity. I heard a story about a, 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 a parent who went to a teacher parent interview and the, in mathematics, and the math teacher looked down the, looked down the list, on the, the mark sheet looked down the list and said, oh, your son, uh, yes, he's safe. What? Oh, he's safe. What, what do you mean? Well, he's got high enough grades and, it, and he, won't be, uh, he won't be dropping down to the lower class, so he's safe. What's that doing for the kid's identity? How's that, how's that, how's that developing an identity where the kids feel like they belong? And that strategic competence that I talked about, and I've already made that distinction between strategic competence and problem solving. So let's have a quick look at another definition of what maths should unlock. And it's the work that PISA are doing around what mathematical literacy might look like in their definition of it in 2021. <coughs> Um, again, Caroline said it before quite well, PISA isn't our curriculum, PISA isn't necessarily what we value, there's pros and cons to it um, all over the place, it gives us a touch point on some evidence, um, but, and so, you know, I'm not saying that we should just blindly adopt this, but it is an indication of where mathematics education might be going globally. So, uh, and this, uh, some of these slides I'm going to show you now are the slides from uh, Peggy Carr, um, who's from the US Center for Educational Statistics and heavily involved in PISA. And so what, what PISA are talking about now is really focusing on mathematical literacy is this ability to reason, to formulate, employ, and interpret. So there's not much calculate in the reason, formulate, employ, and interpret mathematics. And they make a distinction. Can you see that? You don't have to look at the text, but can you this in 2012 was the way in which they, can you see that at the back? Almost, thanks. So, what the, so the way in which they traditionally formulated uh, math problem solving in, um, in PISA has been to say, well, you see the problem in context and 25% kind of, of the work then, of the overall work is formulating the, the response to the problem, putting it into a mathematical problem. And then 50% was the doing, so finding out the answer, getting the mathematical results and some of the interpretation, and then 25% was the reflection back. So that's what they've run with, that's essentially what they ran with in 2012. 2021, what they're doing is they're essentially taking the, essentially the same sort of process, formulating, the employing, and interpreting and evaluating, but they've re-weighted things to add this reasoning. So they put the reasoning, and what were they put the reasoning? They put the reasoning right in the center. They're making maths about reasoning. It's coming back to that cognition thing that I was talking about before. It's a way of thinking. Uh, so in PISA, um, traditionally in PISA, what they've had is, see if we can do this, what they've had in PISA is um, quantity, uncertainty in data, change in relationships, and space and shape. So a way of cutting up the maths content. They're going to keep that, but what they're going to do is, for the quantity, they're going to add computer simulations. To the uncertainty in data, they're going to have conditional decision-making for 15-year-olds. For change in relationships, they're going to talk about growth phenomena 
and for space and shape, it's going to be geometric approximation. So you can see what's happening. They're taking, I call them new ideas, and I thought, no, they're not, these are not new ideas, we've talked about these for ages. But the new ideas for PISA, uh, at least, so the traditional frame, but expanding out the traditional frame, expanding out what we would put in those boxes of things like quantity and uncertainty and so on. And what they're adding in the PISA reasoning, well, you can see that I'm not going to read them all out. But it's interesting, look at that maths as a system based on abstraction and symbolic representation. Epistemic knowledge, understanding how maths works, as well as being able to do the maths, understanding how the maths works. It's getting close to the science as a human endeavour, uh, aspects of the science as a human endeavour part of the Australian curriculum. And so, uh, I'll show you this slide again from Peggy, from one of Peggy's uh, presentations. And what she's done is she said, the black is what we were doing in 2012, and the red is the additional stuff. And there's a lot of additional stuff. You can see at the bottom there, 21st century skills, read down those, of course, what we would call those in Australia, are the capabilities. Oh, I was going to quote the chief scientist, but I'm going to move us on. Um, and then, in the mathematical reasoning, problem solving, they've added those points there. We've already talked about those. And then in the challenging in a real world context, then the content categories, um, and I've, I've uh, shown you those as well. And so, the, so you can see these changes coming. What should maths unlock? Well, PISA have got a, a starting out to have a pretty clear view that for 2021, this is what maths should unlock. unlock. And for me, what this is starting to speak to more and more is this idea of transfer. It's not enough to know the stuff and what the fact, what they're doing is they're adding content on, they're adding the reasoning and problem solving so you can take your maths from over here and use it over there. And she actually showed an example of it. She's talking about the digital delivery system that they use for PISA. And she talked about a number of ways in which that can add value. On one of the ways is through the use of simulations. And look at this. This was a, an, a reasoning item from 2012. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit more than we go. So it's a worded question. So there's two methods of copying CD, duplication and replication, and there's a graph. And you can enter different values in. Oh, so let me just show you the so there's the graph, it's got two lines on it, and you can enter different values in a number of copies at the bottom there, and it'll tell you the price of each. You're not even reading off the chart, it's, it'll tell you the price of each. Uh, and then the question is, that the company makes the statement, duplication is cheaper for short run copying, up to 500 CDs. Explain why the number 500 CDs in the statement is incorrect. And what is the maximum number of copies that would make the statement correct? So what you're doing, well, you can see it, it's a wordy problem, and there's that step of formulating the, mathemat the mathematics out of that, and then you're doing the employing by um, using your knowledge and applying it to this chart. That was 2012. Good 2021. If you can't read that, let me just say what it says. To promote train travel, the transformation, transportation service is distributing a car cost calculator. What well, the calculator does, it compares costs for car travel from home to work and back with the cost of a monthly train ticket. You can use the calculator by clicking and dragging the car to set the distance from home to work. And the window car costs shows the monthly cost of going to work and back by car. That's it. The question is, if Moritz lives 15 kilometres from work, what percentage of his car travel cost would he save by buying a monthly transport ticket? Feels to me like a completely different question. It's front end loaded with that formulation, it's front end loaded with that reasoning, and it doesn't look anything like that read off the chart thing. It says this is a constructor response to this question, uh, to this challenge question. So for me, this looks like a tweak, but actually it's, a, it's going to be a fundamental shift in the way that kids are thinking. 
Uh, Caroline talked before about how Australian students are not doing so well, not doing as well in PISA as they have done before. Lots of reasons for that. Um, some of them mathematical, some of them not so much. I wonder how they're going to go. I wonder how 15-year-olds are going to go with this if they go with this kind of question in 2021. So what the OECD, what PISA are talking about, and again, this is one view, but it's a really influential view. What they're talking about is uh, the problems that our kids are doing need to be look like the real world in their messiness. They don't have to actually be real world questions, but they have to look like it because they're messy, because there's this complexity. Um, so the student's got to do this conceptualizing and organizing, extracting the relevant information. Um, real emphasis on that front end. Uh, rather than the formulating and employ. And I've seen you do this. I've seen you do it in some of the classrooms I've been in. I've seen you do this. I've seen it in the, some of the presentations, some of the workshops that I was in before. But what we can see is a really strong drive uh, internationally in this direction. It's hard thinking. It's strategic competence. So what about the how-to? And again, I think you've seen it in, the, in the, um, some of the discussions today. You know, things like dialogue, student-student interaction, student-student questioning, students getting the thinking out and putting it on the table, having that being vulnerable enough to have a go at that with each other, the questioning that we do. And there's loads of resources. We've been talking about this for years, almost a decade since we produced the, uh, the government uh, department, produced the AC Leaders resource. Remember that thing? Um, uh, still, so it just had a revamp, still available online. Things like the Bringing It to Life tool, which helped teachers to think about the questions that they might ask in the class uh, to bring out things like, and I picked reasoning in this, um, in this example. So what does that question, things like, in what ways can you generalise? What does that look like in years three and four, five and six, all the way through to nine and ten? Just some guides for teachers to step into that. Things like the transforming tasks tool. Uh, so take your textbook, take the things that you've been doing, uh, but just give them a tweak in order to get the kids to do this reasoning, to get the kids to do a bit more hard thinking. I was sitting in this room for the um, uh, uh, workshop uh, just before, and uh, I, won't, I won't spur the blushes of the presenters because it was a great presentation. Um, and I was going through and I was looking at the transforming task and as they were going through some examples, I was circling them, going, oh, that's one, that's one, and I just ended up doing them all, so I gave up in the end. Um, really good examples of um, how to take a, perhaps a traditional task and transform it in some way to get the kids to really do that hard thinking, to get the kids to be doing some productive struggle, some strategic competence, some constructing the response to the question, either individually or together. We've been talking in South Australia, we've been talking about Dan Meyer's work for years as well. You know that work, that blog that Dan had with all those examples of his three-act maths, getting kids to construct a response to the question. And now Dan's working at, uh, he was at Stanford, he's now working at Desmos, and John did the Desmos um, um, workshop earlier. And you know, when Pisa are talking about this quantitative reasoning from beyond solving problems in the traditional sense, in which all the relevant information is given and the student must decide on the maths to be used. That's Dan. That's the, whoever said that is channeling Dan Meyer. Do you remember Dan Meyer talking about how what we do in this kind of textbook maths sometimes is um, we, we set out a smooth, straight path from the question to the answer and congratulate students from stepping over the small cracks in the way. That's what the P's are now just cottoning onto. And I think you've been doing this for a while. It's a direction of travel in the world. It's definitely a direction of travel that we've been going on in South Australia. I was recently at, at <laughs> I was recently at a, a meeting of the curriculum, all the curriculum authorities across the across the country. All the chief executives get together, and we were talking about you know the purpose of educate senior secondary education in, in Australia and where we're all going, the direction of travel. And I was shocked. Some of the states and territories, I won't say which, but some of the states and territories are saying, hang on, we assess and certify courses. The idea that we're about developing students 
and certifying what students can do and what, what, what students know and what they can do with what they know was a bit foreign to them. They weren't talking about this. They were talking about doing it in a box, containing it within a box, within a course, and everything that a student needs to know is contained within that course. And what the OECD and PISA are saying is, it's got to be messier than that. It's got to be messier than that. We've got to be empowering students to use their mathematics in all kinds of different ways. So when Andreas was talking about why do we teach trigonometry, if you listen to what he said, he didn't actually answer that question. Um, he, start, he answered the question, why did we start teaching trigonometry hundreds of years ago? And he definitely didn't have a crack at the answer to the question, why should we teach trigonometry? Because you know, a, maths, a maths educator in South Australia was actually saying to me, uh, we were having a conversation and he was talking about this great work he's doing with students. Um, I just grabbed this data from um, the BOM website. It's the mean maximum monthly temperature in Adelaide, how that varies um, over time. Um, and he was talking about how you know uh, he's working with the students and they're seeing the sine waves. So they're looking for sine waves in lots of things. You could see this broadly, you can see this sine wave here. So interesting conversations about why it's a sine wave and why it isn't a sine wave. But one of the interesting things about it was the kids weren't were really struggling with the idea of a, a sine wave. Because as far as they were concerned, sine was about a calculation. It was about working out the angle in a corner of a triangle. And that's what Andreas was talking about. And yet, of course, where people actually use a sine wave is to tell a story of the world. Where they use the sine function is to understand something that's going on in the world. Because I saw this and said to the teacher, oh, so you can, that's, you can really talk now about proving, or at least getting evidence, that the Earth goes around the sun in a circular orbit. We could talk about that and put that together. And that was really puzzling. What's that got to do with a sine wave? It's got to do with triangles. Um, oh, simulation, that's a note for me. So, um, you know, a sine wave being, you know, there's a thing, it might be a, a weight on a, on a spring, it might be a, something floating on a wave, it might be a voltage change, and of course, you know, what we, what we do is, we talk about that as being, when you run that over, over time, um, we see that as a sine wave, and so often that's, uh, that, axis there, that axis there, we talk about as being time or distance, so talking about a shift, a change, a development. But if I change that from being a timeline to being a sine wave, and now I've got two sine waves running one on top of each other, I've got that circular motion. Do our kids know that? Do our kids, when they experience sine, understand that they're talking about, when we talk about a sine, we're talking about an angle swept through. We're talking about a, 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 a motion, a change. Because I think for lots of kids, they see what Andreas is talking about is they see sine as being a calculation. It's a black box that you stick numbers into in order to solve this calculation rather than a way of understanding the world and understanding how things change and move. That kind of shift, I think, is the shift that PISA is asking us, or the OECD is asking us to contemplate. Because this question doesn't transfer. This question about a man halfway up a flagpole, it's actually, I picked this out because I think it's a reasonable question. Uh, because what we're asking them to do is to find the range of values for which uh, tan of 2 alpha plus beta is defined. So it's a really interesting, so I think it's a really interesting question. It's not just a calculation, we're asking kids to do a bit of thinking. But then when I was looking at some of the other questions, this is my favourite one. What's the point? What's the point? It's a really hard question. Why is it a hard question? Because it's bloody impossible. <laughs> just impossible to see. I can't formulate it because I just can't see it. I'm just going to spend ages just trying to see which angle is which. That's not, that's not delving into my understanding. That's not helping me to transfer something. Maths for maths sake is part of what we are custodians of. We should hold on to that. But maths for this sake isn't what we're talking about. Just in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to make a connection to some of the things like AI. Let me introduce you to Jana Eggers. She runs a, a, an AI company. So just a quick introduction. I am, uh, I've actually been working Can you hear that at the back? around AI for about 30 years. So I was a research scientist out of the Salamis, which has been my career. Um, working with neural nets and genetic algorithms for some optimization functions. But really on that, um, on your left hand, Relationships between things and the um, prediction to understand 
speak about what Pisa was talking about, that front end loading of the formulation of the problem, the front end loading of the of the understanding and the reasoning. Because the AI, because that's the AI. That's what we're, that's the human part of the AI running the formulation and the AI runs the computation. Of course the AI is going even further than that and doing some of its own formulation, some of its own recognition in there as well now. But the people part of it, the math part, it's not magic, it's maths. And the maths part of it isn't the calculation, the maths part of it is the formulation and the reasoning. Even the AI, so we did some work, some machine learning work using PISA data as it turns out, uh, machine le uh, learning work, and what you essentially what we're doing was letting the machine pick out the relationships. And so instead of just seeing one or two relationships, you say, well, if this, this, and this is in place, then kids are effective in their math learning. And if this, this, and this isn't, if this thing isn't in place, then they need that thing in order to be effective learner in math. So you can see all these relationships in the data. But of course, what it, what it does is, it just, does it, it just looks at the data, throws out all those relationships, and then you've got to make sense of it. And then making sense of it the reasoning, the thinking through is the key. It's at the other end, then, of the AI. This is Ram Charan, um, a uh, CEO coach, well-known around the world, um, about helping leaders at companies to be effective. And he's been talking for the last couple of years about how mathematics is the name of the game. How older companies, like IBM and Intel, have had to convert into maths houses. Google, Facebook, and Amazon were born as math houses, were born digital. Apple became a math corporation when Steve Jobs returned. And people like Nokia and, and Motorola failed to do so. And we know what happened to them. Coming back now, but we know what happened to them. So what he, talked about, what he was talking about was these math houses are going to change every other industry. Back to what uh, Caroline was talking about before. In this revolution, they're going to change every industry. And the AI, the maths part of the AI, isn't magic, it's just maths. Let's go back to Jane just for one second. Businesses are changing and the maths is changing the business. What we can do with the maths now is changing the businesses. And it's not just STEM businesses, it's all businesses seeing a big change in the way that, that, that they do business. We've got the Australian Institute for Machine Learning based on her here in Adelaide now. Um, and it's interesting because that's emerged from um, the, an institute looking at visual recognition and visual learning, just like that AI that we've just seen, and really being a leader in Australia. But really, it's coming back to this, the problem needs to be messy, it's a complex world, so the student, or now the AI professional, is conceptualising and organising and extracting the relevant information, putting all that together so that the AI can do that now. So, if maths is the key, what should it unlock? Kind of understanding the story, what is the maths story here that's going on? What's, what's behind this calculation? What's behind this process? Understanding the story, front-end loading um, is becoming more and more uh, prevalent all around the world. And there is a connection there to the careers in AI and some of the ways that maths will be used in the future. Really interesting to look at lots of the maths jobs that are around at the moment. Statistics, loads of statistics jobs. But I think as AI becomes more and more prevalent, we'll see other maths jobs uh, popping up in that uh, that arena as well. Before I go, 
it would be wrong of me not to take the opportunity to spruik the IA Maths Masterclass that's on on the 20th of June. Um, if you want some more information, you can just drop me a line or see Hassan or any of the IA Safe Board team that are here today. Thanks very much.